Um, well, let me tell you about myself. My name is Derek Novak. I work in uh, the Nano Development Lab here at Portland State. Um, I work with Eric Sanchez. He's the PI for the lab. And uh, we use uh, one of Del Mar's um, TISAF crystal, or uh, TISAF lasers. Uh, so what is it we actually do in this lab? Well, why are, we, why are we actually buying this laser? So the idea is to beat the diffraction limit of light. And so to give you an ex example of what that, that really is, because you remember back in like biology class in high school, you know, and you're, you're looking at some amoeba that you pulled out of a pond scum or something like that your teacher is having you look at, and you're sitting there with a partner and you're increasing the magnification of your objectives of your optical microscope. And you realize there's a point where you, you focus, but it's still blurry. And so this is kind of an analogy, but the idea is that blurry spot is this diffraction limit. And so as researchers, we run into this every day. So we'll, we'll have a really high-end optical microscope, and you'll run into these diffraction limits. And that limit is about lambda over 2, and what lambda being the wavelength of light that you're using. So you take that, that wavelength, in our case, about 800 nanometers. You divide it by 2. That means your optical resolution is going to be about 400 nanometers. Um, so to beat that, what we do is we, we use a trick called uh, near-field optics and near-field scanning optical microscopy to be specific. And what we do within this is we take that focus spot and we insert a probe into the spot and the probe itself absorbs the background laser light or illumination source and re-radiates it out as a very little spot right at the very end. And that little spot is what we're going to do to image. So what we'll do is we'll set that up, we'll lower the background level of the light so that it doesn't actually affect the sample. And then we'll take this probe that's carrying around this very high field and we'll drag it around the sample and we'll get these high resolution images. Now these images are on the order uh, from, like I was saying before, the 400 nanometers we're dropping down to about 20 nanometers. Um, so we use multiple methods to do this. We can use uh, multi-photon methods um, uh, to do this. We can look at uh, Raman spectroscopy. We can look at uh, fluorescent spectroscopy. Uh, while we're down there with the probe, we can look at topography of the sample. We can look at, um, oh, what else can we look at? Topography. Uh, we, we can do um, spectral analysis. We can actually see what photons are coming back and what wavelength those photons are at. So we combine this into a centralized system and a central um, microscope that can take all these measurements simultaneously. So what we're developing in this lab is the ability to do that and then also make it available to academic research. So we plan to take that, package it together, make it in a way so that hopefully other researchers can come take our design and actually duplicate it in their lab, and from that duplication, then be able to get the exact same data that we've been getting. Um, um, but where it really comes into play is things like drug delivery. Uh, that's where a lot of people want to look at um, interactions within a cell. So. Let's step back for a second. If you look at an optical resolution of 400 nanometers, there's very few things you can see that are of interest in terms of biology. I mean, you can watch cells kind of dance around, but you can't watch how chemicals are flowing in a cell, how organelles are interacting. Uh, when you can get below that 400 nanometer resolution down into the 20, 10 nanometers, what you can actually watch is little protein channels opening up and, and ions flowing through those channels and actually making something happen. So we're in a collaboration with a, a group here uh, that takes muscle cells, and they, and basically the way a muscle cell works is calcium flows through an ion channel, and when it flows through that channel, it causes it to either expand or contract, depending on the direction of flow. Well, what they're interested in doing is finding ways to inhibit that channel so that it will not expand or will not contract. And where it becomes important is in uh, heart patients. So let's say, suppose you had to go in and you had to get an angioplasty, so they'd go in, open up a little um, artery in your heart, well, the section of the heart that, that you've opened up for new blood has starved for a long period of time. And so it's starved of oxygen for a long period of time. So now it suddenly sees all this oxygen and it freaks out. And so what they want to find out is what kind of drug can inhibit that, that spasm that goes through in the heart. And that way people who have this procedure done, which is very beneficial, uh, won't have recourse of having a secondary heart attack immediately. So the, the, you, the first thing you can ask is, well, 20 nanometer resolution is very obtainable with scanning electron microscopes, uh, transmission electron microscopes. Why would you need to build another system to do this? Well, our system has the ability to work in atmosphere, has the ability to work in solution. So when we look at these calcium release channels in the muscle cells, we can actually create a fake membrane, 
have the channels uh, attached to the membrane, and we can have then we can make a small experimental setup where we bring the probe in. They're attached to this membrane, and we can now flood them with solution, causing them to react. And while they're reacting, we can be scanning over these, uh, watching them uh, conformationally open or close. Uh, the actual TISAF itself is important because if we do time dynamics to watch them open and close, we can do um, where we are exciting one uh, area that has the dye molecules on them to, that are attached to the channel to watch it open and close, uh, while watching um, the other channel and the timing between those two dyes, and then we'd be able to then get more confirmational information than just using a basic laser. So that's really where the TISAF will come into play um, during the experiment. Okay, so we're going to use these probes that we're going to make, these uh, metal probes for the near field uh, images. And so what we'll normally start out with is doing a chemical etch. And so the chemical etch itself will be specific to whatever metal you want to use. So you can use you know, silver, gold, tungsten, um, whatever kind of noble metals you want to use to actually do the imaging with. And there's different reasons you choose different, different uh, materials, but usually it has to do with field enhancement, the type of sample you're using, um, and what reacts best with the metal that, you're, um, you, know, that you need for what in field, field enhancements that you want. So we have different etch parameters that we use, different uh, different um, chemicals for different materials. And once we've etched them, we'll take them and we'll do a quick analysis on a uh, scanning electron microscope just to verify that we're getting good parameters. Uh, the bubbles. Yeah, those three, just kind of going towards so the So we've chemically etched the probes, and now we're going to bring them into the scanning electron microscope and look at uh, their initial geometry so we can get an idea if they're going to be a suitable probe for our needs. And from there, we're going to then take the probes out, and we're going to physically mount them to quartz tuning forks, which I can show you what those look like. No, I do have, I actually have some right here. Um, so these two guys here are quartz tuning forks. And where you get these is basically, uh, they're a timing crystal you find them on computer motherboards and other locations. But we have a little trick where you can cut out this cylinder and expose the tuning fork itself. And uh, this has been used in a process of scanning probe microscopy called where they use a, a tuning fork method. And so we physically mount the uh, our etched metal onto the end of these uh, tuning forks. A, a really good example of what, how these probes are then used is we take the probe and uh, using an atomic force microscope, we bring the probe down into our focus laser spot. So it's kind of demonstrated by this cartoon here. Uh, so basically what ends up happening is light comes in, is absorbed onto the probe, probe absorbs that uh, electric field, re-radiates it out at the end like a lightning rod effect and assists in a thing that we like to call TENOM, which is tip enhanced near field optical microscopy. Uh, so this lightning rod effect creates a high localized field right here at the end of the probe and now what we do is we take the background and we lower it so that it doesn't cause the sample to react or fluoresce and um, just the area in the highly localized field is what will cause the fluorescence of, of your sample or the Raman imaging or whatever kind of um, optical information you're trying to get back from the system. So this just kind of gives you a kind of a basic example. This is no um, near field, this is purely far field. Uh, best commercial money can buy right now, and then this is with the uh, near field our near field system um, added on top of that. So basically, adding an AFM on top of that gives you uh, this higher resolution. So this is optically about 300 nanometer resolution. Uh, this here is uh, roughly 20 nanometer resolution.